This video is brought to you by Wix. What's up guys, Jared here. We're always getting requests from fans saying, you guys have got to cover insert movie, TV show, video game, meme, book, sarcastic joke here. We'll then enthusiastically watch it, brainstorm for a really long time, and often come up empty handed. It's not that we can't think of anything. The show might hint at ideas, but not fully develop them, or evidence keeps coming up refuting our argument, or sometimes a show is just plain inconsistent. Or hey, maybe we're just too dumb to figure it out. So when it came time to look at Netflix's surreal retro futuristic love story, we didn't quite get where we hoped. We dug and dug and found some really cool stuff, but a cohesive philosophy of not quite. So we're gonna do something a bit different. We're gonna go through the ideas we considered, show how and when they work within the context of the show, and why we ultimately decided not to go with it. And hey, maybe this will serve as a foundation for you to think about the show in new ways. This is another experiment for us, so be sure to let us know what you think in the comments. And without further ado, welcome to the inaugural episode of Wisecrack Half-Baked Edition on Superbad 2 Maniac. And yep, spoilers ahead. But before we get into that, I wanna give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Wix. Wix allows you to build a great looking website, whether you're a freelancer looking to showcase your skills, or you're just looking to share unused footage of yourself tied up in a dank basement. <coughs> Either way, it's legit free to get started. Just head to wix.com slash wisecrack to sign up. And now back to the show. All right, guys, so first a quick recap is in order. Wish me luck. Maniac primarily focuses on Owen Milgram and Annie Landsberg. Owen, the schizophrenic black sheep of a very wealthy family, struggles with delusions of saving the world and a made-up brother. Annie, a broke girl with a dysfunctional family, struggles with drug addiction to cope with the death of her sister and the estrangement of her mother. They enter a highly experimental pharmaceutical study run by three doctors in a supercomputer called Gertie that hopes to eradicate psychological pain by having patients identify, map, and ultimately confront their issues through drug-induced fantasies. Annie and Owen's wires get crossed, causing them to inhabit each other's fantasies where they experience whole lifetimes together. Gertie gets depressed after the death of Dr. Muramoto, threatening the experiment and the subjects. Inside the final fantasy, Annie comforts the computer, finds the resolve to move past her sister's death, while Owen confronts the fact that his fantasy brother is just an idealized version of his crappy real brother. He saves the other patients and, back in the real world, finds the confidence to stand up to his family. In the end, Annie's friendship inspires Owen to escape from a psych ward and have faith in his ability to function. Or was that a fantasy? All right, now onto the pitches organized from best to worst for your entertainment. Pitch one, Don Quixote. This one is an eight out of 10, almost good enough for a video. Miguel de Cervantes' modern classic is everywhere in Maniac. One of the fantasy scenarios even revolves around Owen and Annie infiltrating a seance to find the fictional lost final chapter of the novel. So why this focus on an old book? Well, let's break it down. Don Quixote tells the story of Alonzo Quejano, who becomes so obsessed with books about chivalry that his mind dries out. Essentially, he goes mad, which makes this line extra ironic. I'm gonna read you this time, because I am healthy Annie now, and healthy people read books. Inspired by his books, Alonzo decides to become a knight errant himself. The bulk of the book follows him as he goes on wild adventures, including the one where he famously attacks windmills he mistakes as giants. Windmills happens to be the name of Maniac's second episode, which briefly features Annie looking at some during the road trip that ends in her sister's death, but trust me, it gets deeper than that. Already we can draw a parallel between the madness that makes Don Quixote want to perform heroic acts and Owen's schizophrenia that makes him believe that he will save the world. Like Don Quixote, Owen can't distinguish reality from fiction. But more than that, Don Quixote inhabits a dreamlike mind space that makes castles of inns and giants of windmills, turning the regular world into a fantastic one. Similarly, the ULP treatment turns its patient's sad realities into fully fledged fantasy adventures. Annie's lemur painting becomes a bizarre recover the lemur story, the copy of Don Quixote she picks up becomes the steal the final chapter plot, 
Annie and Ellie watching a Lord of the Rings-esque show becomes this, and Owen's hawk that kills Ernie the gerbil inspires the Save the World from Aliens tale. This is madness. I loved Ernie. If I was a secret agent, I would know I was a secret agent. But perhaps the most powerful connection between the two works is the shared theme of transformation through the power of dreams. Congratulations. You're healed. In the case of the Don's delusions, he adventures so that he may reinvigorate a golden age when people were more authentic. As he says, blessed the time and blessed the centuries called by the ancients the golden age. In that time, women spoke their thoughts of love from the soul, simply and pretentiously, exactly as they thought them, not searching for elaborate verbal circumlocutions to beautify them. Truth and simplicity were unmixed with fraud, deceit, and malice. Justice remained firm and sure, neither troubled nor offended against by patronage and self-interest, as today she is so grievously tainted and troubled and persecuted. Judges did not feel themselves, as they do today, entitled to be tyrants. If Don Quixote's fantasies represent his yearning for the days when people weren't full of shit, then one could say the ULP experiment uses fantasy to heal a society that has been defined by isolation. As James suggests at the beginning, all levels of physics require collision and bonding in order to progress, and so does the human heart. Camaraderie, communion, family, friendship, love, what have you. We're lost without connection. It's quite terrible to be alone. However, the world we're presented is one that is tragically absent meaningful connection. Hello, Mrs. Finkelstein. Fuck off, Donovan. It's, uh, Owen. The first two episodes introduce a vision of New York in which people are more alienated from each other than ever. Most of the human interactions we witness are purely transactional. Nice friend. This is made quite literal with Friend Proxy, a service that provides you with someone pretending to be your friend for a fee. You're using a service that gives you pretend friends. I have real friends, this is just more convenient. Then there's Ad Buddy, where a human being pitches you a product in exchange for goods and services. It's kind of like getting free content on the internet, but having to watch annoying ads. There even appears to be a market for people to escape the world entirely. Enter Avoid, a box that basically allows you to hibernate your life away instead of engaging with the outside world. There's also lines like this. Thank you for braving the outside world for me and the fact that Azumi and James sleep in isolating drawers. The encroachment of consumerism into every facet of our lives is further emphasized by the omnipresence of advertisements, from the ads that purchased Annie's face, to the neon signs blaring through Owen's window, to ad copy on bridges. In Maniacs New York, you can't even take a shit without being bludgeoned by ads. So, Don Quixote uses fantasy to bring back an ideal era of authentic expression, and Maniac portrays two lonely souls finding connection through fantasy in an era of isolation. You don't f this up. I won't f this up. It's important to note that in many of the ULP fantasies taking place in the quote, real world, all the creepy retrofuturist stuff seems to disappear. When trying to save her lemur, for instance, the world goes from what the 80s thought the 2000s would look like to just the 80s. But there's an important qualification to mention here. This golden age that Don Quixote waxes poetic about never really happened. There are many characters in the book who bemoan the negative effects of chivalry books, deeming them trash and assuring people that there was never such an idyllic time. I can swear to you that, in fact, this world has never seen a single one of those knights, nor any of their grand deeds or their stupidities. In the end, Don Quixote is tricked into hanging up his lance and becoming Alonzo Quejano again, he eventually renounces his madness, and dies a quiet death. Similarly, Annie ends up rejecting Gertie's offer to stay in the fantasy world with her sister. She accepts reality and, together with Owen, moves forward confidently. Annie, why are you here? He's my friend. The problem with this is that although it's clear that Annie's break from fantasy is considered a positive development for her character, there's more ambiguity surrounding the conclusion of Don Quixote. Are we supposed to agree with the bulk of the characters in the book who claim that fantasy has done nothing but make him a fool? Is it good that he's no longer out adventuring? 
Or should we look at it like Don Antonio Moreno, who says, May God forgive you for the damage you've done to the whole rest of the world in trying to cure the wittiest lunatic ever seen. Don't you see, my dear sir, that whatever utility there might be in curing him, it could never match the pleasure he gives with his madness. So why wasn't this made into a full video? Well, despite these really great connections, what else is there to say? That reality is better than being a McMurphy? That fantasy is a liberating force for humanity? Thank you for such an exhilarating experience! It seems like the connection between the two works is that they both vaguely deal with the nature of fantasy versus reality, but not in a way that could really provide a definitive philosophical thesis. Pitch 2, Mommy, Daddy, and Me. Ah, I give this one a 5 out of 10. Up top, we should mention Owen's name. His surname, Milgram, is a reference to the Milgram Experiment, in which subjects were given the ability to electrocute people and continued to harm them under the suggestion of an authority figure. Pretty cool shout out, but we didn't really see how it connected to any of the events in the series. There's also some serious Freudian undertones. James is a paraphilic, meaning he's attracted to inanimate objects. He also has a strange relationship with his mother. In fact, if we want to get all Oedipal, and we always do, the Oedipal triangle of mother, father, and child seem to be important for many of the main characters. Annie's mother walked out on her father, Owen's dad is an overbearing fascist, and Mantle Ray, also without a father in his life, You drove my father away and you slept in my bed way too much! Literally goes blind after confronting his mother. I can't see! Not so different than, say, a tragic figure who stabs his eyes out after romancing his madre. He also built a computer modeled on his mother's mind, and while that's not in the Greek tragedy, it seems pertinent. The computer is... you. What? The ULP test also functions on the idea that our mental ailments can mostly be attributed to some unresolved trauma. For Freud, many of our neuroses and mental health problems were brought on by unresolved trauma that we must work through. The three stages of the ULP treatment take a similar approach, but with the mapping and confrontation stages being more fantasy lives and less laying on the couch talking about your mom. But the connection we really wanted to make was to a pair of thinkers who were strongly opposed to Freud's method, philosopher Gilles Deleuze and his psychoanalyst sidekick Felix Guattari. The three things that got our spidey senses tingling were, one, the use of the term arborization to describe the method they used to map the brain, two, there are bonsai trees everywhere, and three, the opening monologue suggests that the universe and life are a chaotic series of collisions. For Deleuze and Guattari, the dominant way of thinking about the world is arborescent, that is, resembling a tree. We often think about history and society like a tree, starting at a trunk and growing in a mostly linear fashion while occasionally branching. But Deleuze and Guattari preferred another natural metaphor, the rhizome. Rhizomes are the roots of plants like ginger or weeds like dandelions. The important thing about rhizomes is that they look like a series of connections with no visible starting point, like say the roots of a tree. Basically, the world is too complex to be understood linearly, and instead of simple cause and effect, there's inputs, outputs, feedback loops, and a lot of chaos that we barely understand. So why does this matter for Maniac? Well, in some cases, we could view the opening monologue under this framework. Life isn't so much a straight line as it is a chaotic assortment of random connections, like the structure of a rhizome. The crossing of wires for Owen and Andy kind of follow this logic. The straight line of their computer connections are interrupted by a random connection. Bonsai trees, in theory, would be an interesting addition to the symbolism. Not only is it defined by linearity and branching, but that branching is intentionally guided by a human hand. I just love little trees. Maybe we could say that the show ends up somewhere in the middle between the totally chaotic rhizome and the guided branching of the bonsai tree. After all, Annie starts the show saying, There is no plan or pattern to the universe, it's just chaos. And ends the show saying, This, it, this is a sign. Friend Proxy Owen. Maybe the universe isn't total chaos. We ultimately abandoned this idea because we couldn't find any evidence that linked the bonsai trees to the couple times that chaos versus order is referenced. We had a few other clues too, but they went nowhere. For instance, Deleuze and Guattari are well known for their book Anti-Oedipus, which challenges people who sought to analyze the world in Freudian terms. Specifically, they wanted to break free of the Oedipal triangle, mommy, daddy, and me. 
And Mantle Ray, after interpreting his blindness as a symptom of his mother's behaviors, rejects this Freudian framing and accepts that it was instead brought on by a kiss from Azumi. There's also this probably random coincidence. Felix Guattari wrote a screenplay called A Love of UIQ, which at least sounds kind of like ULP, about a subatomic consciousness that inhabits a computer and falls in love with a human. Plus, Deleuze and Guattari use schizophrenia as a model to think about the world, where our desires were not limited by the confines of society, or say, capitalism. And yeah, Maniac shows a kind of dystopian capitalism and there's a guy with schizophrenia, but it doesn't quite work. Pitch three, Owen's schizophrenia. Yeah, this one's the worst. Now, opposed to Deleuze and Guattari's notion of schizophrenia, which we need to say is not exactly literal to the medical condition, there's Frederick Jameson's rebuttal to them. Jameson suggests that when people are so bombarded with commercial images and messages about who they can be or how a product will make them into this or that person, they're actually imposing competing ideas of identity onto them. Therefore, this causes a perpetually shifting identity or a schizophrenic subject, and the more one's identity vacillates, the more one consumes. Therefore, the schizophrenic subject is ideal for such an economic system. I'm Compass Mentis. There's little doubt that the show hints at a causal connection between advanced consumer capitalism and isolation, but is Maniac using Owen's schizophrenia as a metaphor for the ills heaped upon the denizens of the dystopia? Mm. No, definitely a stretch. It's interesting, but there's no evidence we could point to to make a confident case. Just because we couldn't come up with a cogent argument about the show's grander messages doesn't mean it isn't a good show, nor does it mean it isn't a smart show. There are some extremely clever things going on. The constant Easter egg references that connect the dreams not only to other dreams, but to real life. The focus on how narrative builds meaning in our lives. Our brains are just computers that make our life stories make sense. And the small details at the end that make us question the validity of the real world above others. Get it? Like Wendy the Lemur. What makes Maniac so impressive is its daring visual aesthetic, its formless structure, and its regular dips into absurdity. And for that, we can't help but admire it. It sticks to a relatively simple thematic base and runs with it. That people need connection, and it's our ability to bond that can give us hope to beat our demons. That's all for now. Let us know what you think about our half-baked format, and as always, thanks for watching. But before you go, we want to give a shout out to Wix, the website building platform that allows you to create a website for any occasion. From the student trying to showcase their research to the advanced designer creating a portfolio masterpiece. Wix enables you to make a professional and unique web page. Also, it's completely free to get started. Wix will enable you to create a professional and unique web page. We also found that they were the perfect place to host our main page, but while that's still under construction, we've used their community features to create a temporary site so that you can vote on what you think we should do next. Right now, if you head to the link in the description, you can decide on which bingeable Netflix show we should cover on our movie podcast, Show Me the Meaning. Yeah, I know it's for movies, but hey, we're trying something new. We've had a lot of fun creating these pages and love hearing your feedback. Get started by creating your own website for free by clicking here or visiting wix.com slash wisecrack.